This is the night the Denver Nuggets are at home, ready to bring home an NBA championship for the first time in franchise history. But there's other news, and we'll cover that, too, in the 30 minutes before tip-off. Colorado's gas pipeline safety program gets poor grades for the safety thing, which seems like the most important part. Pride in Colorado Springs, where a community stands defiant after the club Q shooting. There's power in being together, and there's power in love. And yeah, we'll make a little bit more time for the Nuggets before tonight's Game 5. It's big enough he flew in from Japan. We'll get you a tip off in time right after tonight's edition of Next. The Denver Nuggets can win the NBA championship tonight. Going to repeat it because that's the first time in history that could be said. The Denver Nuggets can win the NBA championship tonight. Fans are filling Ball Arena ahead of that 6.30 tip. Game 5, Nuggets heat. Nuggets took two down in Miami so they could come home with the 3-1 lead and the chance to win it all in Denver. On East Colfax at the DNVR bar, home base for a lot of Nuggets fans, they had a line out the door at 11 a.m. People showing up with their laptops so that they could claim a seat, then <clears throat> work remotely throughout the day, and then be in place for tonight. When it comes to covering the Nuggets best, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, or at least right outside the arena. Tom Green, tell us a Nuggets story. Well, I got the headband. I should tell the story. I mean, that, that tells a story in and of itself, doesn't it? You know, I was thinking about it today because so many people are referring to this as the biggest game in Nugget history. And it's, it's funny because normally in a sports sense, you'd always have a debate about something. There's no question about it. It's the biggest game in Nugget history. It awaits tonight. It's a little over 30 minutes away. We have an eye on the sky here that give you a look at the outside of Ball Arena as the crowd starts to make its way in. A little over half an hour to go. So many people so eager have already made their way in the building. They want to drink it in as long as they can. It's going to be that kind of night. It got me thinking about all the old days of watching the, the Rockets and the Nuggets. And from an NBA perspective, it was 17,000 days ago that the Nuggets played their first NBA game. It was a Friday night in Indiana. They were able to beat the Pacers that night behind 30 from Dan Issel. And then over 17,000 days... They might have come close, but never really threatened to win a championship. Now this night, tonight, so many people think it's going to happen. Why? Well, the Nuggets have won nine out of their last ten games, playoff games. That's hard to do in the regular season, much like a playoff game. And the Heat, they're going the other way. They're two and six in their last eight. So I, I just think it seems inevitable. I look for the Nuggets to play their best game of the series tonight. And if they play their best game of the series tonight, Kyle, they'll be partying in the third quarter because they'll be making uh, short work out of the Miami Heat. And this NBA season will come to a close with the Larry O'Brien Trophy being handed to head coach Michael Malone and his players. It really has the setting of a very special night here for people who've been here for a long time, those Nuggets fans who've endured the 17,000 days waiting for this here tonight. It really, it really does have that feeling, Tom. I mean, you nailed it. The, the overwhelming confidence that Nuggets fans have because they have seen that this team's best can't be touched by any other team's best, at least not down the stretch this season. Yeah, and they seem like they take it all very seriously. They don't seem to be one of those teams that enjoys a win so much that they drop two out of their next three or something like that. They've been so focused and so tightly knit as a family, as a group. Uh, they've been quite a show to watch. And, and whether it's Christian Brown coming off the bench or Bruce Brown in the fourth quarter the other night or you know Aaron Gordon suddenly finding his three-point shot, it doesn't always have to be Jokic and Murray. But tonight it's going to be Jokic and Murray. All right, Tom Green. Love to have you on next. Thank you. Storms before noon today. You know, we've got a few weather ground rules around here, and morning storms are a thing that we just do not do. But we got them today, and the rain's going to stick around through the night. Boulder got a heaping helping of hail today, like an inch or two of hail in places in Boulder. The mayor there, Aaron Brockett, shared video of hail washing away in floodwaters near Boulder Medical Center on Broadway. Be careful if you're on the roads there, especially on the south end of Boulder, where some of the heaviest rain fell. Most of the severe stuff has moved out east, Danielle Grant, but still enough that we're going to be watching, I guess, flood risk through the evening. And again, yeah. AM storms. I know. What is it? You're telling me it was 10, 30, 11 o'clock at my house. I'm still drinking my coffee. Come on, Mother Nature. we got to wait till 2, 3 o'clock, right? That's how we roll here. Not the case today. The hail, it's still out there in Boulder. This is our camera out there toward Pearl Street, and you can still see it. Oh, my goodness, what a day. We have the flash flood watch in place 
at least until midnight for the I-25 corridor up through the foothills off to the eastern plains. See this area right there around I-70? That's flash flood warnings. They've seen one to two inches of rain so far within the past about hours time. So we're going to be watching for a bit of a mess out there if you're traveling in and out of Kansas. And look at that. The heavy rain continues to come down. Just throw on the lightning tracker, more than 3,500 strikes and all of those more or less pretty much across eastern Colorado. They are just getting blown up out there with the heavy rains that continue to come down. Good news is all of this will be shifting off to the east over the course of the next couple of hours. We still have to wait for a few more. And up there in northern Colorado, they're getting a light show as well. Back here around the urban corridor, heading out to the watch parties, keeping a close eye on the game. I think we're going to be good to go. We might have one or two isolated showers between now and about 9 p.m. Otherwise, we're going to do it all over again tomorrow. We'll go through the timing, Kyle, in just a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Danielle. Denver School Board Vice President Ayante Anderson is dropping his re-election bid. He's going to run for the State House instead. A recent poll commissioned by business interests found that Anderson only had 9% support for re-election to the school board. Today, Anderson announced that he is instead going to run to replace Democratic State Representative Leslie Herrod when she's term limited in 2024. Anderson led the effort to have school resource officers removed from DPS in 2020. He's also censured by board members for flirting online with a teenage girl before he knew her age. Anderson's been a focus of a lot of the criticism that the Denver School Board is too focused on politics and interpersonal arguments. Anderson already drew several challengers for his at-large seat before he abandoned that race. Kwame Spearman, former Tattered Cover CEO who joined and dropped out of the crowded race for mayor this year, he's running for the at-large seat on the school board. Anderson welcomed him to the race, shading him, saying, quote, hope that he remains committed to the campaign through the entirety of the election. Now it's Anderson vacating. Anderson had another challenger in Paul Ballinger, a DPS parent and former private school security consultant. It's called Colorado's Gas Pipeline Safety Program. An audit found it can't prove its safety record which kind of seems like the whole point. Here's Marshall Zellinger. If not for the sign, you may never notice the infrastructure hiding in plain sight. Gas pipelines like these are supposed to be inspected and reviewed by state regulators. A newly released state audit on the gas pipeline safety program questions the safety part of the program. It's not that things are being skipped. It's that they might not have been documented as well as they could have been. Katie O'Donnell is the Director of Public Engagement for DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, which includes the Public Utilities Commission, the same PUC we talk about in our Excel stories. The PUC also handles gas pipeline safety. It is hard for the public to feel like they're safe if they know nothing about the work that's going on behind the scenes. If your introduction to the gas pipeline safety program is because of the audit, there's work to be done to make you feel safe. Some key findings. Safety requirements for out-of-compliance operators were rarely enforced. Fines are inconsistent and appear to be rarely paid or enforced. And records were not kept to show pipelines were actually being inspected. And when they were, they didn't add up. For instance, in 2022, the audit found that one inspector did all operations and maintenance inspections remotely in half a day. If that's true, it would have been 2.1 minutes for each inspection. The audit also found another inspector did all damage prevention inspections remotely in one day, which would have been an average of 7.9 minutes per inspection with no breaks. The state believes this is purely a result of bad record keeping. It's not a minor thing. We take the documentation really seriously, but... It's not that somebody hasn't been out there doing the required inspections and the boots on the ground to make sure that the public is safe. The audit was also critical of natural gas companies, saying 54 gas-related accidents were not reported to the state's gas pipeline safety program. And the auditors only knew about seven of them because they were reported on by the news. The PUC and DORA agreed with all but one of the three dozen recommendations and the other one they partially agreed on. The part that I'm still waiting for is on if there's no proper documentation showing pipelines were inspected, how do you prove they were inspected and that it's simply not missing paperwork? Yeah, I mean, if there's a question about whether you do any actual work or if you've just got your feet up on the desk watching Nuggets games, you could be like, here's a fat stack of stories that I've done. But I mean, like, what's, what's the punishment for if they don't comply? Right now, it's not clear because based on the audit, there's a lot of these that take 
months and years to go through a legislative process or, or a legal process. And so fines could happen, but if you're not getting fined like we saw with the, the Firestone explosion, yeah. multi-million dollars, like, yeah, what, what is the incentive other than you don't want to be the next company that hears about an explosion on the news because you, you had bad infrastructure, but then you don't want to be the state inspector saying, oh, did we miss that pipeline that, sure. that, that happened because of us? Marshall, thank you. And thank you for your support of the work of Historicor through your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. Since the middle of last week, you've raised more than $9,000 for that nonprofit that restores historic structures all across Colorado while their volunteers learn skills for careers they can take into the building trades. If you know of a nonprofit anywhere in Colorado that could use our help, just email me next at 9news.com. I'll check them out. Together, you have raised nearly $11 million for more than 150 fantastic organizations. An emotional Pride Fest in Colorado Springs. Club Q is a good reminder that Pride isn't always a celebration. Celebrating progress while remembering those lost this year. And a Nuggets fan travels from the other side of the world in hopes of watching a historic win tonight. That's next. Oh, it has been a soggy May, a soggy June, a soggy start to the year. 18th wet it start to a year that we have had on record here in Denver. So far, more than 10 inches of rain. Typically, we should be a little over six. As we look ahead toward this evening, between about 7 and 10 p.m., maybe one or two quick showers here in Denver. Nothing major, nothing like what we saw earlier. Heaviest rain showers will still linger across the northeastern plains overnight. By 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, what is this? It's coming back for us. Again, we'll see those showers mainly tomorrow morning, and then by the afternoon, afternoon into the evening, our skies finally start to clear as that storm system finally moves out. Chance for seeing a few storms turn severe across far southeastern Colorado tomorrow. Again, flash flooding. That really will be our biggest concern. There it is, 10 a.m. The possibility for a few more thunderstorms and temperatures that will only be in the low 60s. These numbers running at least 20 degrees below our average. The thunderstorms continue for the rest of the work week, but look at Father's Day weekend, the 80s, the sunshine, drier weather, Kyle. It's coming back. As you you're right. Nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Pride Fest in Colorado Springs over the weekend doubled as both a celebration and an opportunity for a community to collectively mourn. Organizers tried to strike that difficult balance at the first Pride Fest since the Club Q shooting in November, where five people were killed. Here's Mark Salinger. <laughs> Okay, so welcome y'all to our weekly Pride meeting. To organize a celebration. We're getting it done. A brewery is a pretty good place to start. That would be great. <laughs> In between beers and spreadsheets comes a realization that this celebration will not be like the others. Celebrate, but also mourn. Holly Nip. Oh, of course, it's super emotional. Justin Burns. There is a lot of pressure. And Johnny Tippett's. Um, understand organizing this Pride Festival takes humanity. Pride this year is going to be a lot of mourning and a lot of remembering of what happened last fall. November 19th, 2022. Five people killed in an LGBTQ bar in Colorado Springs. Eight months later, they meet at the brewery owned by the man who stopped the shooter to organize a Pride filled with mixed emotions. We want to pay tribute to the people, the victims, like the family members in one aspect, but we also want to celebrate pride as well. So I'm expecting celebration, I'm expecting tears, I'm expecting a whole spectrum of emotions. All right, we're going to go ahead and get this thing started. The, um, hello friends and welcome to Pikes Peak Pride. I'm shocked you're here. For the first Hi, time friends. since a safe space was attacked, rainbows fill Colorado Springs with color. It's just, it's pure madness. And like things come up that we didn't know we had to plan for. The ideas from the brewery come to life at a festival that celebrates and mourns. This pride is very different because everyone is still healing. We should be proud of who we are every single day. There's power in being together and there's power in love. And I think it's also a little scary for everybody today. I'm not gonna lie. In the middle of so much color, a memorial sits in black. Five beautiful souls were taken from our community. Soon, our it'll be covered in messages of love as a community reflects. We want this event to be for everybody, but especially those who were impacted by the Club Q event. Even in a park filled with thousands, five people will always be missing. I think Club Q is a good reminder that pride isn't always a celebration. Pride is a complex cocktail of different emotions. 
Throughout the planning process for this Pride Festival, every decision was made with the families of the Club 2 victims in mind. We're at a planning meeting where they discussed billboards and buttons to give out to people. From the biggest memorials to the smallest, they decided to check with the families to make sure those gestures weren't misconstrued. And as we well know, families are never going to agree on everything, but hopefully the fact that they've reached out means a lot. So Rich Fierro leading the parade and what an emotional honor that was for him. He was not the only person tied to Club Q who's front and center. Exactly. He led the parade as Grand Marshal on Sunday yesterday and all the other survivors of the Club Q shooting were right behind him as well. There was also memorial service on Saturday that everybody was honored at with a moment of silence at 11.56 a.m. The shooting took place at 11.56 p.m. that night. Mark Salinger, thank you. He developed a love for the Nuggets decades ago, and distance could not diminish it. I'm a big fan. <laughs> big fan, really. <laughs> no pressure, Nuggets, but you got to win tonight. Yosuke came in from Japan. That's next. Nuggets Heat Game 5 tips off in 10 minutes. We will wrap up here with plenty of time for you to switch over and see the Nuggets play for an NBA championship tonight. First, though, I want you to meet Yosuke Kondo. When he left Japan to come to college in Colorado, he did not know much about American culture. And the Denver Nuggets were his introduction. 31 years later, he now promotes his love of basketball with club programs in Japan. And it's why he came back for tonight. I just bring the tea to t-shirts, my favorite. Nuggets is my life, you know. My name is Yosuke Kondo, I'm from Tokyo, Japan. I was in the student, 1992 to 1995. Uh, I transferred to the University of Colorado at Boulder. Brown. I planned uh, to join the game one because a historical moment. Oh, oh, oh. My favorite Murray, I love him. I used to love in the Dikembe Mutombo and the Makumu Abdul Raruf. But now it's uh, 27. Who's that 27? There have been most of Japanese people asking me, hey, you should know that the him, you know. <laughs> I watch it on the TV from Tokyo. So, oh my goodness. So it's, it's a time, it's time. Now we have many, many fans of that NBA and uh, we have two uh, Japanese players in the league right now. They uh, win the game four. I uh, asked my wife, uh, can I go back to Denver? <laughs> so, oh, well, just do it. <laughs> that she said, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> then I'm here today. I don't care the languages, uh, nationalities, everything. Basketball gives us uh, great friends. So I, that's why I started the basketball business in the town, especially for the kids. Maybe tonight we get a championship, the next one t-shirts with the NBA champion Denver Nuggets. Get a championship, <laughs> the first time, exactly. <laughs> let's go, let's go Nuggets, go Nuggets! Welcome back. Yosuke Kanto says, trip from Tokyo, about 15 hours. Got in last night. Asked his wife first, smart man. Your feedback next. <music> feedback tonight from Consuelo, who says, we need about 100 Marshall Zellingers. He's the best. I tend to agree. 100 Marshall Zellingers, you'd run the world. Feedback from Max, what 63 Chevy did you steal the seat covers from to have that jacket made? Is that, I can't tell if that's a compliment or a criticism. I like it either way, to be honest with you. And then Jonathan writes in to say, the W has already been awarded for the take that L on the way out shirt. I, I'm surprised that the bosses are allowing me to wear it on air, but I also didn't ask them before I did it. Go Nuggets. And any Heat fans in town, I hope you enjoy your stay. Take that L on the way out. See you next time.